Okay, so we're moving through chapter 3, and a lot of chapter 3 is about solving quadratic equations. Well, so far, we are experts at solving quadratic equations by graphing. Sketch the graph of the parabola. Does the parabola cross the x-axis? If it does, then those places where it crosses the x-axis are known as solutions. They're also known as x-intercepts. They're roots. Uh, those are all synonymous terms. We discussed how to find the solutions to a quadratic equation using the graphing method. And if the parabola never crosses the x-axis, then there's no solution. Well, yesterday's lesson we solved by a different method. We used factoring. So we went back and we reviewed factoring, and we were able, in some cases, when obviously factoring is possible, we are able to solve quadratic equations by using factoring. But unfortunately, factoring is not always possible. And the graphing method isn't necessarily great for solving. So when factoring isn't possible, and we don't really want to do the graphing method, we're going to rely on two other methods. One of those methods we'll deal with today. All right, so I want to show you how to solve quadratic equations by using what is known as completing the square. I'm going to lay a little groundwork first. Okay, before I get into solving this problem by the completing the square method, where does this term, this phrase, completing the square, come from? What is that all about? What's the square? I had somebody ask me that years and years ago. What is this square that they're talking about? Well, you don't have to write this down, but I just want to introduce today's lesson by giving you what is known as a perfect square trinomial. And I want to explain to you why it is called that. A perfect square trinomial, first of all, it's got three terms, trinomial. Um, the characteristics of it are these. The first, if you notice, the first and the last terms have perfect square roots. That's got to be, first and foremost, true. Now, if you take those square roots, in this case x and 3, and you multiply those together, you would get 3x. Now, if you take 3x and double it, or multiply by 2, you're going to get 6x. So this is the proof that x squared plus 6x plus 9 is a perfect square trinomial. And you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is if we have perfect square trinomials, they factor really easily. There it is. I love it when I see perfect square trinomials and I'm asked to factor because that's it. I don't have to go through any box method. I don't necessarily have to think of the factors of 9 that add up to 6. Um, it's just a real simple, straightforward way to factor. Okay, well if perfect square trinomials factor really easily, then what this method says is let's create a perfect square trinomial where maybe there isn't one, okay? And so for purposes of illustration, I'm going to set this equation equal to zero because this looks a little bit more like the problems that you're going to be doing today. I just subtracted six from both sides. All right. I do not currently, in red, have a perfect square trinomial because 30 doesn't have a perfect square root. All right, since 30 isn't a perfect square number, I'm going to move it to the right side, and I'm going to replace it with a number that does have a perfect square root. So my first move, if necessary, is to move this constant that isn't a perfect square root number to the right side by whatever means necessary. In this case, it's going to be subtraction. And I'm purposely leaving a space here for a number that we say completes the square. Completing the square method. Okay, well, what is that number that completes the square? Well, here's how we find it. Do you remember how I showed you the easy way to factor perfect square trinomials? Question? Go ahead. Plus, I'm just adding. 
Yeah, if you have a question, raise your hand. It's fine. I'm going to add a certain number to both sides of this equation. All right. Well, here's how you're going to come up with that number that completes the square. The factoring of a perfect square trinomial always looks like this. We saw an example earlier. Here's what goes in the parentheses. Just think square root of the first term. The square root of x squared is just x. I always just bring down whatever sign this is. If this were minus, then I'd be bringing down minus. Now, this number in the parentheses will always, if you like these always statements, they're kind of safe. I like them because I don't have to worry about things that change. Here is an always statement. Whenever you're completing the square and you want to know what is this number in the parentheses, the second term of the parentheses, you always look in front of x and divide that number by 2 every single time. 12 divided by 2 is 6. Okay, so let me ask you this question. If we did write x plus 6 down twice and use FOIL, what would be the very last term after we multiply? Can you think about it? 36. Okay, that is the number that completes the square. And that number needs to be added to both sides of this equation. So before I go any further, let me just recap some important things. To get the number in the parentheses, you always divide, we call this the linear coefficient, the number in front of x, you always divide by 2. The number that you're always going to add to both sides of the equation, notice it's always adding, will be whatever that number is in the parentheses squared. Okay, and now I'm going to simplify the right side of this equation. Negative 30 plus 36 is 6. And now I'm going to, from here it's pretty much smooth sailing. I just need to undo raising this parentheses to the second power. And the way I undo the second power is I do the square root of. You can think of it like this. There's an invisible 2 here, it's called the index of this radical. We don't write the 2 for square roots. But in effect, this 2 cancels that 2. They just make each other go away. And what's left, after I do the square root of the left side, will just be what's in the parentheses. Well, in Algebra 1, you learn that whatever you do to the left side of an equation, you've got to do that same thing to the right. So over here, i got to do the square root of 6, but I also always have to include something else. We talked about this in the last lesson. Whenever you do the square root of both sides of an equation, you must include what? Or else I'm not going to get two answers, and I'm supposed to get two answers. Plus, minus. Right now, if I just leave it as the square root of 6, that's one answer. And I'm supposed to get two. So the way I'm going to ensure that I get two answers is I'm going to consider positive root six and negative root six. And now I'm one step away from getting to my solution, which is solving for x. I just need to subtract six from both sides. So let me give you a heads up about what answers are supposed to look like tomorrow. Now if you look in the back of your book, which is fine, unless you're just writing down answers, that's not fine. That's not going to help you do anything. In the back of your book, when you look at the odds, uh, I think they're going to be decimal form. They're going to find the square root of 6 in decimal and then go ahead and add those two together. I do not want decimal answers tomorrow. I want what are known as exact answers. Exact answers means we're going to stay in radical form, but we're going to reduce or simplify the radical if possible. I can't simplify the square root of 6, so this is going to be my final answer. So one more time, do not go to your calculator. Let it give you the decimal form of the square root of 6, which is 2.2 or 2.3, and then add those and subtract them. Simplified radical answers only. Clear? All right.
Let's move on to another one. Okay, the whole idea behind completing the square is let's work with a perfect square trinomial. Is this a perfect square trinomial? No, 11 doesn't have a perfect square root. So 11's going to the other side. And a space is going to be provided for a number that does have a perfect square root. So my next step is what is that number that will be the number that we say completes the square? Okay, so here's how I find it. I do my parentheses squared. Square root of x squared, bring down whatever this sign is, and then 10 divided by 2, always divide by 2, is 5. Okay, so the number, and I'll change color just for effect, the number that's going to go in each of these blanks, it's always addition. You never have to worry about, are you adding that number or are you subtracting that number? Just get rid of that thought. It's always addition because anytime you square a number, no matter what that number is, will the result of that be positive or a negative number when you square it? It's got to be a positive number, so that's why both of these are addition. And 5 squared is 25. So the number that I add to both sides of the equation that we say completes the square is 5 squared, or 25. And now I just put these two together. I got 36. I'm going to show this step one more time, and then from here on I'm not going to show it. But my next move to get rid of this exponent 2 is to do the square root of. Remember, this 2 and that 2 basically cancel each other. And it's just going to leave what's in the parentheses. But if I do the square root of the left, I also have to do the square root of the right. And don't forget plus minus. Okay, you with me so far? And my last step, well, next to the last step to solve for x will be to subtract 5. Now this answer is going to be a little different, obviously, because I don't have a radical involved in my answer. When you come tomorrow and we're ready to check answers, I hope you don't give me this as two answers. Because we can actually simplify these regular numbers. They're not radicals. So the way I'm going to come up with my final two answers is I'm going to do negative 5 plus 6. And hopefully you see negative 5 plus 6 is positive 1. And I'm also going to do negative 5 minus 6. Negative 5 minus 6 is negative 11. So those are my two answers. So this is great, but it's not great to stop with. When you have a chance like this where the numbers are just integers that can be combined, you need to go ahead and do that to finish off your answer. Questions on letter B? All right. Let's try this one, and then I'm going to let you try one on your own. Um, I don't have a perfect square trinomial here because 24 doesn't have a perfect square root. So I'm going to move that number to the right side and create a space for a number that does have a perfect square root that completes this perfect square trinomial. Here's how I find that number. Just go ahead and make your parentheses squared. And in the parentheses, I'm going to have x, square root of x squared. This sign comes down, and 10 divided by 2. And 25 will be the number that adds to both sides, that completes this perfect square trinomial. On the right side, I put negative 24 plus 25 together, and I get 1. My next move is to do the square root of both sides. I'm not going to show it, but here's the result. The square root of the left side will just give me x minus 5. The square root of the right side, I'm going to write something down and then I'm going to change it. I have several people, not just in here, but I got several people that like to do this. Well, it's not terrible, but I don't see a lot of the same people. I'm, I'm going to completely change this and then I'll come back, so bear with me for a second. I don't see people do this. They'll just say 3. 
I don't see people say the square root of 16. They'll just write down 4. So what is it about 1 that causes people to keep the root, the square root? Because what is the square root of 1? Isn't 1 times 1 1? The square root of 1 is 1. So I'm trying to encourage uh, really several people that like to write the square root of 1. Uh, we need to stop writing the square root of 1 and just write the simplified 1. All right, and I got uh, my next move is to add 5 to both sides. And this is similar to the previous problem. I can actually combine these and come up with two integer answers. 5 plus 1 is 6, and 5 minus 1 is 4. Any questions so far? Okay, I'm going to let you try this one on your own just to see what you can do with it. And uh, we'll come back maybe after a minute, minute and a half, after you've had a chance to write some stuff down. We'll see what you came up with and then um, see if I can help you. Okay, so uh, the first move is to get rid of that negative 8. And uh, we're going to come up with a number that causes this to be a perfect square trinomial. And in the parentheses, it's going to look like x plus 1. You just divide whatever's in front of x, divide it by 2. And the number that completes the square will be whatever this number in the parentheses is squared. And that's just going to be 1. 1 squared is 1. So I'm adding 1 to both sides. I'm going to do the square root of both sides. And now I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides to solve for x. And putting these two different, really it's like two different equations together, negative 1 plus 3 is 2, and negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4. So that is your answer for letter D. Any questions? All right, let's take a look at letter E and see how this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, do I have a perfect square trinomial as it is? It kind of looks like it at first, right? I would say I'm going to try to put a percentage on it. I'm going to say 90% of the time when the first and the last terms are perfect square root numbers, you probably, there's a really, really good chance you have a perfect square trinomial. Well, this is not one of those times because the square root of x squared is x, square root of 9 is 3, 3 times x times 2 is not 4. So this can't be a perfect square trinomial. So let's move the 9. We're going to replace it with another number that will cause this to be a perfect square trinomial. So here's how we'll get that number. Go ahead and make your quantity squared. X minus 2. Always divide by 2. And now we're going to square this number. Notice, it's negative 2 technically, but what's negative 2 squared? Positive 4. That's why, again, both of these are always going to be plus. You're, you're going to be adding a positive number. So negative 9 plus 4 is negative 5. Okay, square root of both sides gets rid of the exponent 2. And boy, I'm glad we had less than 3, 3. Because we're asked to simplify the square root of a negative number. And that's going to be using our friend, the number i. So never leave an answer like this. Going forward, all square roots of negative numbers need to be simplified using the number i. So let me just jump to the final answer. I had to add 2 to both sides. And the simplified form of this radical is i times the square root of 5. So technically, I've got two different answers. I've got two different complex numbers, 2 plus i root 5 to go along with 2 minus i root 5. So do you have any questions Again, no decimals. Just leave it in simplified radical form. 
Any questions on this? The number i? Yeah. Well, uh, thinking of it as two radical factors, uh, to make the square root of negative 5, I'm going to use these two radicals multiplied together. And the definition of i, i technically is always equal to the square root of negative 1. So really, just think of this as just regular i. Does that make sense? Any other questions? All right, let's move on. Here's the thing about completing the square. You need to be on the lookout. Uh, this problem is a little bit different than the previous ones. Do you see it? Do you see what's different? Do you see that the number in front of x squared is greater than 1? Well, here's the deal. With completing the square, if this first number, the number in front of x squared, is not 1, you can't complete the square. That's got to be true before we can do anything else. So my first move in this problem is to divide all the way across by 2. Now I'm in position to do what we were doing before. This isn't a perfect square trinomial, so I'm going to move the negative 6. I'm going to undo it, add 6 to both sides. Clear a space for the number that completes the square. And here's how I find that number. Parentheses, x plus... And I always divide whatever's in front of x by 2. And this is going to be a fraction. Don't let that scare you. It's just 3 over 2. And what's 3 over 2 squared? We'll just square both numbers. 3 over 2 squared is 9 fourths. All right. I'm going to change to common denominator. So the number 6 as a fraction with the denominator of 4. Well, I hope you can see that that would be 24 over 4. Isn't that equal to 6? Now they have matching denominators. I can add them together. 24 plus 9 is 33 over 4. Okay, square root of both sides to get rid of that exponent 2. Now, half of this fraction can be simplified. But half of it cannot. I can't simplify the square root of 33. If I could, I would go ahead and give the simplified radical form. But I can simplify the square root of 4 and just make it 2. So I've got one more step. I'm going to subtract 3 halves from both sides. And let me give you an alternative answer. This, this would be okay. There's nothing wrong with this answer at all. But you might come, you might get something on your paper that looks like this, and I just want you to know it's, it's really the same thing. Since we have a common denominator, you could just put all of it over 2. So red and blue are identical, both OK answers. Any questions on letter F? Good? OK, let's try letter G. Similar, uh, don't just jump in and try to complete the square. If there's a number in front of x squared that's not 1, you need to make it 1 first, whatever it takes. So in this problem, I'm going to be dividing by 2 again. And that's what I get. This isn't a perfect square trinomial, so I'm going to get this number out of the way. and create a space for a number that will create a perfect square trinomial. Let's 
weird looking three. All right, let's see if we can find that number. Square root of x squared, bring down the sign. Um, what happens when I divide three halves by two? Yeah, uh, Campbell said it. He said three fourths. Isn't dividing by two the same thing as multiplying by a half? Dividing by a fraction means multiplying by its inverse. Or three over two times one half is three fourths. Let me make sure you understand how we got three fourths there. Everybody good? Any questions? I'll write it out. Um, three over two divided by two. Dividing by two is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal of two. So think this. Okay. So what is three-fourths or negative three-fourths? Doesn't really matter. It's going to be the same result. Question? Multiplying by a half. Um, that's the same thing as uh, dividing. Let me write this back up. If I do three over two by two divided by two, it's called a complex fraction. Um, dividing by two and multiplying by a half are the same thing. So it makes it easier to simplify this if I just treat it as two fractions multiplied together. Well, that's what that's this step. You always divide whatever's in front of x by two. Okay, that's a good question. Anybody else have a question? Okay, so when I square negative three fourths, I get nine sixteenths. Just square both numbers. Um, don't know why I wrote three four three halves x. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, let's think common denominator. So if I'm going to change three over two into sixteenths, that means I'm going to have to multiply two by eight, right? Well, if I multiply 2 by 8, I've got to also multiply 3 by 8. It's 3 times 8. 24. So 3 over 2 is equivalent to 24 sixteenths. So, Kate, 24 sixteenths plus 9 sixteenths. 33 sixteenths. All right. We're off and running. Square to both sides. X minus 3 fourths plus minus root 33 over 4. Square root of 16 is 4. And one more step. I'm going to add 3 fourths to both sides. And that is a sufficient answer. Or if you wanted to put all of the numerators all over 4. 3 plus minus root 3 all over 4. That would be okay as well. Any questions? Okay. Um, 